Every now and then, there are stories so strange that one thinks they can only come from a movie or be conceived by a novelist, but they are indeed true. And when they become known, there isn't really an explanation for them. Depending on what they're about, they sometimes leave an unsettling feeling, especially when it concerns an impending apocalypse. Sometimes a meteor that would pulverize our world. Sometimes asteroids that, despite other calculations, were believed to hit and destroy the Earth. And psychics predicted a date when the Earth would perish. People watched these videos and only a few believed them. But there's one thing that went very differently from everything we've heard and seen before. In 1965, a man named Thomas Chan wrote a book. In this book, he describes an apocalyptic scenario that makes every Hollywood movie look like a child's birthday party. He describes in his book that this apocalypse is not the first that humanity has had to experience. And what's so frightening about it is the fact that he describes it as something that will happen again. But before anyone could read this book, before anyone knew what it was about, the CIA confiscated it. It was classified as secret by the CIA and hidden from the public eye for almost 50 years. The big question is, why? To add to the mystery, when the manuscript was released due to the Freedom of Information Act, it had only 55 pages. However, it is said that the book originally had 2,004 pages. So, what's going on with this book and what was written in it? In the first chapter of his book, Adam and Eve Story, Thomas Chan describes a gigantic catastrophe. It all starts with a so-called pole shift, meaning the Earth's poles shift, a pole reversal. And what follows is this gigantic catastrophe. According to Thomas Chan, this is not something that threatens us alone, but something that regularly happens on our planet. These gigantic catastrophes have completely wiped out civilizations before us. And these catastrophes, according to him, were not something that developed slowly. In the scenario that Thomas Chan says threatens us, humanity would cease to exist within hours. According to his description, such a pole shift, which we have never really experienced but does exist, results in the Earth temporarily stopping its rotation. The Earth rotates around itself at approximately 1,000 miles per hour. If there's a slowdown due to this pole shift, the land masses might remain stationary, but everything else on Earth that's essentially moving with it at 1,000 miles per hour, a speed we don't notice, would fly around. This includes the oceans. Because if the Earth temporarily stops or its speed slows down significantly, it's like slamming on the brakes. And if you've ever been in a car going about 80 miles per hour, you don't really feel the speed until you slam on the brakes. So, in the first moment, everything that isn't firmly attached to the Earth would fly around at 1,000 miles per hour, this includes houses, cities, and everything on the Earth's surface. All of it would be swept away in an instant. And Thomas Chan says this isn't just a threat to us, but something that has already happened, and not just once. He refers, for example, to the biblical flood. I'll get to that later. First, I want to read to you how he describes this whole scenario. So sit back, grab a cookie, and let's dive in. With a rumble so quiet that it can't be heard, which intensifies, throbs, and then turns into a thunderous roar. The earthquake begins, one that is incomparable to any earthquake in recorded history. In California, the mountains tremble like flags in a breeze. The mighty Pacific rears up, forming a water mountain more than twice its usual height. Then it begins its journey eastward. With the force of a thousand armies, the wind attacks, tearing and shredding everything in its supersonic path. The incredible mountain of Pacific water follows the wind eastward, burying Los Angeles and San Francisco as if they were mere grains of sand. Nothing, absolutely nothing, withstands the relentless overwhelming onslaught of wind and water. Across the entire continent, the wind rages at a thousand miles per hour with its hellish, unholy fury, mercilessly and incessantly. All living things are torn to shreds as they are blown across the land, and earthquakes leave no place untouched. In many places, the molten subterranean layers of the earth break through, spreading a sea of white-hot liquid fire. Within three hours, the wall of seawater moves across the continent, burying the wind-ravaged land under two miles of water. In a fraction of a day, all traces of civilization are gone. 
the great cities of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, New York, and Boston are now just legends. Hardly a stone remains where, just hours before, millions of people walked. A few lucky ones who managed to find shelter on the side of a high mountain peak, shielded from the roaring wind, watch as the sea of molten fire breaks through the quaking valleys below them. The raging waters follow at supersonic speed, piling up higher and higher, steaming over the molten earth fire and rising almost to their feet. Only great high mountains like this one can withstand the catastrophic onslaught. North America is not alone in its death throes. Central America suffers the same barrage of wind, earth fire and flooding. In South America, the Andes are not high enough to stop the catastrophic force that nature wreaks in its berserk fury. In less than a day, Ecuador, Peru and western Brazil are violently shaken by the devastating earthquake madness. The others are overwhelmed by the relentless onslaught of the Pacific, which rolls against the mountains, piling up ever higher. The entire continent is burned by molten earth fire and buried under cubic miles of catastrophic sea surge, then turned into a frozen hell. Everything freezes solid. People, animals, plants and mud all become rock hard in less than four hours. Next, it's Europe's turn. Europe cannot escape the onslaught. The furious Atlantic rises ever higher and follows the screaming wind eastward. The Alps, the Pyrenees, the Urals and the Scandinavian mountains are shaken and then lifted even higher when the tidal wave hits them. In Africa, the sands of the Sahara disappear in nature's fury under the wild assault of wind and sea. The area between the Congo, South Africa and Kenya is only hit by the heavy earthquakes and winds but is hardly flooded. The survivors marvel at the sun, which stands still in the sky for almost half a day. Siberia and the Orient indeed suffer a strange fate. As if a giant underground scythe sweeps away the Earth's foundations, accompanied by the wind in its screaming symphony of supersonic death and destruction. As the Arctic Basin leaves its polar home, East Siberia, Manchuria, China and Burma are exposed to the same destruction as South America. Wind, earth fire, flooding and freezing. Jungle animals are torn to shreds by the wind, piled up into mountains of flesh and bone, and buried under avalanches of homogenized seawater and mud. Then comes the sudden, seemingly endless supply of terribly instant temperature drop of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 82 degrees Celsius. No human, no animal, no plant, no mud, no earth, and no water remains unfrozen on the entire East Asian continent, which mostly lies below sea level. Antarctica and Greenland, their ice caps now spin in the Earth's torrid zone, and the fury of the wind and floods lasts for six days. On the sixth day, the oceans begin to settle in their new home, draining from the highlands. On the seventh day, the cruel rage is over. The Arctic Ice Age has ended, and a new Stone Age begins. The oceans, the great homogenizers, have laid another deep layer of mud over the existing layers on the Great Plains. The Gulf of Bengal Basin, east of India, is now at the North Pole. The Pacific Ocean, west of Peru, is at the South Pole. Greenland and Antarctica, now spinning equatorially, find their ice caps melting like crazy in the tropical heat. Massive walls of water and ice crash into the oceans, tearing everything from the mountains to the plains, forming huge seasonal moraines. In less than 25 years, the ice caps have disappeared, and the oceans worldwide rise by over 200 feet with the newly added water. The torrid zone is shrouded in fog for generations due to the enormous amounts of moisture released into the atmosphere by the melting ice caps. Greenland and Antarctica emerge with green tropical foliage. Australia is the new unexplored continent in the northern temperate zone, its vast expanses populated by only a handful of survivors. New York lies at the bottom of the Atlantic, crushed, molten by fire and covered by incredible amounts of mud. Of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas and Boston, not the slightest trace remains. They will all join the legends of the seven cities of Chibola. What remains of Egypt emerges from its Mediterranean flood, new and higher. A new age. The cataclysm has done its work. The greatest of all population regulators once again does for man what he denies himself and the planet he lives on, driving the few survivors into a new stone age. So far, 
the first chapter of this book. These are not pleasant prospects if you take them at face value. In summary, he describes how the Earth would rotate by 90 degrees during a pole shift. I've read a bit in some forums about what people think, and there are two opinions. Some say we've never experienced a pole shift, so we don't know what would happen, and we can't rule out what Thomas described. Others argue that we are so advanced in science that it will be as science says. We will notice it in many ways, but such a global catastrophe won't happen. But let's continue with Thomas in his book. He assumes that the next pole shift is already underway. That was in 1965 when he said that. But we know today from all the reports that have been going through the press lately that the poles are indeed starting to shift. And as mentioned, Thomas says this isn't the first time this has happened. He continues in his book, saying there was a great flood about 6,500 years ago. This great flood is recorded in various ancient writings. In the Christian world, it is the biblical flood. Other regions of the world also describe a great flood for the same period, like the Gilgamesh epic, the deluge in Greek mythology, and the flood narrative in China about you the great. But all have one thing in common. The dated period is almost identical. And he uses these narratives, which all pinpoint almost the same period when this flood supposedly took place, as evidence for his theory. He says we know from these narratives that something similar to what he has now described has already happened. There must have been pole shifts in the past in which the earth was flooded with water. And in our Western Christian culture we know this event as the biblical flood. The rest of the book deals with things that still exist today. So-called alternative archaeology, always in reference to or as evidence for what he wrote in the first chapter I've read out. After what I've read, the question arises, why was this book confiscated by the CIA and stored behind closed doors for more than 50 years so that no one could read it? And that's not all that's strange about this case. As seen at the beginning, this book was cleared for release in 2013, but it was still not published. It was still withheld, and only in 2019. Was it finally released to the public? But what was the reason for all of this? Whether you believe it or not, the CIA's response was that they no longer remember why it was confiscated. It's been so many years. The book just sat there, and no one took care of it until someone eventually asked if the book could finally be published. Only then did the people currently working at the CIA realize that this book was in their custody. For the past 50 years, it apparently didn't interest anyone, and no one took care of it. So there's no answer as to why this book was confiscated. It's lost to time. At the time this book was published, it wasn't the only book of its kind with such apocalyptic descriptions, but there's a difference in this book compared to other books of this kind published at that time. Thomas challenges what is described as divine in the Bible. In the 50s and 60s, the intelligence agencies were heavily staffed with strongly Christian individuals. And when someone comes along and says, hey, the biblical flood wasn't caused by God, it was due to a pole shift. He's challenging the Bible. I'll read another short passage at the end of the chapter where he describes this cataclysm. He writes, After this cataclysm, only Adam and Eve... Atlantis and Demolimp remain, and Jesus joins Osiris, Aroa, Zeus, and Vishnu. With this, he essentially states that Jesus aligns with the gods of other civilizations and is no longer the Christian God. He implies that our religion and other religions will perish, and a new mixture of religions and gods will emerge. There are also one or two other places in the book where, let's say, Jesus doesn't come off too well according to Christian beliefs. Now, imagine that in the intelligence agencies. As mentioned, there were very conservative Christians at work, many of them. And then someone comes along and says, the biblical flood wasn't from God, it was due to a pole shift. And after that, Jesus and the rest won't exist anymore. Afterward, all gods will have disappeared, or there will be a mixture of all gods. And then this description of this gigantic cataclysm, which is not triggered by God but by nature through the pole shift, could potentially upset a very conservative Christian. 
And if there are several of them who also have the authority to confiscate something, so that no one reads it, if they don't want the Christian world to have any doubts, then I could imagine them saying, let's just confiscate this. But that's just a thought of mine. Everything else in this book has been there many times before, just without any reference to Jesus or God or questioning the Bible. Who was this Thomas, actually? When you read what he wrote, you assume that he has a relevant background. However, he doesn't. And stories that he once worked for the CIA on secret projects are not true. Thomas Chan was an author, and he dealt with topics that we still know from various authors today. These are books that lean towards the esoteric. Besides, he wrote other books. For example, one about natural childbirth, or one about extrasensory perception. Thomas Chan was not a scientist, and there is no scientifically founded data for everything he writes in his book. This means, in his opinion, a pole shift would proceed like this, but there are no scientific proofs for it. What he addresses in his book is precisely what is still being addressed today. These are authors, and I don't mean this disparagingly, who simply question the scientific findings in the field of archaeology and publish their theories. And such a book by such an author is this book. So this existed already in 1965, but where are the missing pages of this book? I'd like to take you on a little journey to Michigan State University. At this university, they collect every book ever published in the United States. There's a directory that specifies when the book was published, how many pages it had, who wrote it, and so on. And when we look into it, we see the information about this book. It states that it was published in 1965 and had 55 pages. If we look at the book as it was originally intended to be published, you'll see that it's a notebook. Even the cover is made of paper, so it wasn't a real book. But if you search online, you'll find books with this title by Thomas that have 220 pages. It's relatively simple to explain. You'll notice that after page 55, it's no longer Thomas writing. The publishers in which this book was later published added explanations and further theories. But that's not the original by Thomas Chan, which indeed had 55 pages. They also advertised that this book was confiscated by the CIA. That's a fact, as I showed you at the beginning. Now, some online listings claim that other books by Thomas Chan are finally released and fully available. In reality, not a single one of his other books was ever confiscated by the CIA. So, because the CIA once confiscated this book, there's been a lot of confusion, whether intentional or not. Currently, there's a lot of talk and writing about a pole shift because the poles, the magnetic poles, are moving. Some scientists believe that a reversal of the magnetic poles might be imminent. Now, it is your turn. If you'd like, please share your thoughts in the comments. And if you found this video informative, please give it a thumbs up. I'd appreciate that. Otherwise, I hope to see you again. Thanks for watching.